adults or older humans, because we're seeing that Sorry, we're seeing that um, our genetic machinery just gets older as we get older. It's letting more mistakes through and the immune system is also getting a little more tired and letting those mistakes through. So that's why we see the cancer incidence increase with age. So the big question is like, is are the rates of cancer actually increasing or are we just finding it more often? And I tend to think it's the latter. I think there's been huge advances in the last couple of decades about how we're caring for our dogs. Dogs are increasingly members of our family. They're not dying from accidents or infectious disease processes as often. We're getting a lot better at disease screening and preventative care. So I think we're just catching things more. Um, certainly if we're ever ultrasounding an older animal for some other disease process, it's very common for us to, to find a secondary cancer kind of looming. So I think it's that we're seeing patients not die of other things and we're just catching it more, um, but can't completely rule out that there are some environmental factors at play. That's just very hard to test for. You would really need two very similar populations of dogs that are huge where only one factor is different to really be able to tell if, if there's an environmental risk. Um, and unfortunately, those studies are, are just hard to do in veterinary medicine. And the studies that we do have don't have necessarily a, a ton of evidence that there is something at play. But we'll talk a little bit more about our specific cancers. So starting with hemangiosarcoma. So hemangiosarcoma is a tumor that arises from the endothelial cells, which are cells that line blood vessels. Um, and ultimately, these tumors form these collections of very abnormal blood vessels. So this is just a, a little cartoon that shows the normal blood supply in the body is usually a, co a collection of smooth tubes that are going from decreasing diameter to increasing diameter and back, and it's very organized and the lining cells are very smooth. In tumors, there is just abnormal blood vessels being formed. Usually it's because the tumor is sending signals that it needs a huge blood supply. So blood vessels are being formed as quickly as possible and they're very haphazard and disorganized and also very fragile. So these tumors can rupture and bleed very, very easily. And that's what we commonly see as their clinical signs. We also unfortunately see that they grow very, very quickly, which makes screening very hard and they're highly metastatic. And that's by nature of them, again, being tumors of blood vessels, they can shed their cells just freely into the blood and then they float to the rest of the body. So risk factors, um, breed is a large risk factor for hemangiosarcoma. We see it very commonly in breeds like German Shepherds, Labs and Goldens. In general, we see it more often in large breeds, um, although we can see it in smaller breeds or even cats as well. Increasing age is also another risk factor, again, much more common in older animals. And then one question that has come up is, are spayed or neutered animals more likely to, to get hemangiosarcoma? The evidence is really, really mixed. And some of the studies that have said there was maybe an increased correlation or an increased incidence of hemangiosarcoma in spayed dogs only were looking at specific breeds and specific locations. So I think there's still a big question mark because we really need to look at studies like across multiple types of dogs and multiple locations to be able to draw any conclusion. But that is, again, potentially something that is going to be further investigated. So the spleen is the most common uh, site for hemangiosarcoma. The spleen is an organ in the abdomen that is involved in immune response, it's involved in blood formation, um, but it's not necessarily a vital organ. Dogs can do very well without their spleen. So spleen is the most common location that we see hemangiosarcoma. This image on the right is a spleen and all these kind of dark red nodules are hemangiosarcoma tumors throughout the spleen. Uh, we can also see it in the right atrium or right oracle of the heart, so one of the chambers of the heart. And it's estimated about 5 to 10% of dogs can have concurrent disease both in the heart and spleen at the same time. So typically, um, we at least want to check um, those patients to make sure that it, there's not disease hiding elsewhere. We can also see hemangiosarcoma in the muscle. We can see it in the skin or invading into the subcutaneous tissue. Luckily, that is less aggressive 
overall than the, the hemangiosarcoma that occurs more in the organs or deeper in the, the muscular tissue. And then very rarely we can see it in the liver or the bone. And because it's a tumor of blood vessels, technically we can see it anywhere, but these are just the most common places. The other locations are, are very uncommon. So clinical signs are going to largely depend on where the tumor is, but most of the clinical signs will be secondary to this tumor suddenly bleeding or suddenly rupturing. So it's very common to have just a very sudden collapse or weakness. Sometimes on questioning, we do see that there were maybe little incidences over a week or two prior to a bigger collapse episode. So maybe a day where they just seemed really tired, it's common as here, like they went outside and didn't really want to come in, were just laying out there. Um, and then the next day they got better. So what happens typically in those situations is there's a little bleed. The tumor bleeds typically into the, a body cavity like the abdomen or the chest. And with time that blood is reabsorbed. And so then the dog feels better because they got their blood volume back. But that can continue to occur until they have a really big bleed that makes them really, really weak. So if they are having an active bleed, they can have very pale gums. So this is a picture. Um, dog's nose is over here, their teeth. So gums should be normally nice and pink. These are pretty white and they can be even whiter than that paper white. I will warn you, if you start looking at your dog's gums regularly, be aware of the light that you're around. You know, I feel like whenever I go to look at my dog's gums, I'm always like in bright sunlight. I'm like, oh my God, she's pale. And then I like move her, I'm like, no, she's fine. So just be aware of your surroundings. Um, so pale gums, sudden pot belly. So suddenly if their abdomen is full of blood, they can get a more pot bellied appearance. Their belly suddenly seems larger. Um, they can have difficulty breathing if the, the tumor is bleeding into like their heart cavity or the lungs, um, or just as sec secondary to them having a sudden loss of blood volume. And then if it's like occurring in the skin or in the muscle, there could be bruising in the area. So diagnostics, you know, this is, these are commonly patients that present on emergency, again, because there's just a sudden collapse, a sudden change in their demeanor. So the veterinarian will do an exam, of course, and may have a good kind of suspicion of what's going on. Um, might do further blood work. On that, we can see anemia or blood loss. We can see platelets, low platelets, and it can be normal, and that largely depends on when the patient presents, again, if they're presenting during active bleed or if we're finding this more for a little bleed or if it's just an incidental finding. Ultimately, we need imaging to make a diagnosis. So ultrasound of the abdomen, ultrasound of the heart. On ultrasound of the abdomen, we'll see free fluid. So this image, ultrasound um, fluid is going to be black. So there's some free fluid in the abdomen up here. Tissue is white, so there's this splenic mass here. I don't expect you to interpret this. It takes years and years and years to interpret ultrasounds. Um, but then what's a classic appearance for hemangiosarcoma in the spleen is there's these little black kind of cavities within this, this mass, and that's areas where it's filled with blood. So that's a pretty classic appearance for hemangiosarcoma in the spleen or even in the liver. Um, depending on other locations, a CT scan might be needed. We typically do chest radiographs to look for evidence of metastasis, but we don't always sample these guys um, with either an aspirin or biopsy prior to sending them to surgery. One, because again, it's usually an emergent, emergency sort of situation. And two, because there are tumors that are made out of blood vessels, oftentimes the sampling is not very useful and we'll just get blood if we, we try to stick a needle in it and figure out what it is. So if it's looking like a hemangiosarcoma kind of classically in presentation on imaging, oftentimes we'll move forward with, with further treatment at that time. So treatment kind of comes under three parts. First, again, usually these patients are weak and are having a bleeding episode. So we want to stabilize them with fluids, with blood products. If it's a heart-based tumor and it's bleeding into the, the lining of the heart, we might actually need to remove fluid so that the heart can continue to beat and function normally. And then we want to move to surgical removal of the tumor. And that's ultimately going to stop further bleeding events. It's going to stabilize the patient. 
um, and just you know, make them feel much better. So again, most of these tumors occur in the spleen. Splenectomy is a fairly straightforward surgical procedure because the spleen just lives very superficially in the abdomen. It's fairly easy to remove in terms of surgical procedures. But we know that there is a very high risk for metastatic disease. And unfortunately, most of these patients will have metastasis present that we just can't find at presentation. So we want to address that ideally with chemotherapy to try to slow down the spread and stop this further spread of metastasis. Um, and usually the chemotherapy we're reaching for is called doxorubicin, which is a given IV typically for five doses. And that's kind of the, the strongest chemotherapy we have. It's the one that has shown the, the best outcome. Um, and studies looking at additional oral chemotherapy added onto doxorubicin so far have not yielded more superior results. So we're kind of stuck with just doxorubicin as our main treatment. Unfortunately, the prognosis is very poor um, because of this being a very highly aggressive and highly metastatic tumor. So the, the median survival time, which I'll shorten to MST, um, that's really oncologist talk. That's what we talk about a lot when we're comparing papers. Um, but it's the point at which 50% of patients have died of their disease and 50% are still alive. So for the median survival time for hemangiosarcoma with surgery and chemo is four to six months. So even with aggressive therapy, we're still looking at a fairly short survival. If there's metastasis present at the time of surgery or if we don't treat with chemotherapy, it's likely less, um, just a couple of months. If we happen to find the splenic tumor earlier before it has bled, um, then it might be a little bit longer, maybe up to, to eight or nine months. But it is very hard to screen um, for hemangiosarcoma just because it can occur so quickly. So even if you're doing you know, the best you can and you're ultrasounding patients like every year, every six months, hemangiosarcoma can still pop up very quickly and it could pop up between those kind of normal screening ultrasounds um, the story I like to tell just to demonstrate this is one of our other oncologists' dogs had hemangiosarcoma of the heart. They staged her, did an ultrasound to make sure her spleen was okay, sent her to surgery. And when she was recovering in hospital from the surgery to remove the tumor around her heart, she developed blood in her abdomen and there was a splenic tumor. So between you know, a couple of days of screening, it had popped up. So it can be very, very quick. Unfortunately, most dogs ultimately die of metastatic disease and have recurrent bleeding events either into their belly or into their lungs. So because it's such an awful tumor, we're always looking for other treatment modalities. Of course, our most famous hemangiosarcoma patient in the last couple of years has been Scout, the Super Bowl dog. Um, he had hemangiosarcoma on his heart and it was not um, able to be surgically removed. So for him or dogs like him, we have been doing radiation therapy um, to the heart-based tumors or if hemangiosarcoma pops up in other locations where surgery is just not possible. And we have seen with radiation therapy that those tumors actually do shrink in size. We can stabilize them. We can make it so they don't have further bleeding episodes. So it does seem like we're doing something um, to give them extended, extended good quality of life. So there's Scout and there's me in my five seconds of inner of Super Bowl fame. Um, the other thing we're looking at right now is different chemotherapy protocols. So vinblastine is another type of injectable chemotherapy. And then propanolol is a beta blocker that's traditionally been used for hypertension, treating high blood pressure in patients. And they actually use it topically in children who have what's called angiomas. So these are benign tumors of blood vessels, so similar to hemangiosarcoma, but they typically occur on the face um, and in certain locations they are not amenable to surgery. So they use this topical propanolol and we can see regression of these tumors in, in the pediatric patients. So that's what kind of prompted interest in looking at this in dogs. Um, and I will say information is still coming. We're using it quite commonly now, but we haven't accumulated our data yet to see if it's beneficial, but it certainly doesn't seem like it hurts and it might help. And then the last thing I mentioned here is Yunnan Biao. It is a Chinese herb 
that we don't exactly know what is in it, but traditionally it was carried by soldiers on the field so that if they were injured or shot or wounded and were bleeding, they would take this pill to stop bleeding. Um, so we have been giving it to patients, especially if we're in like a palliative setting where we know that they have a tumor or metastasis and we're not doing further treatment. We at least give them unit bio to see if we can stop some of those bleeding episodes and again, improve their quality of life, um, improve their clinical signs. And I think anecdotally, I feel like it does help. Um, again, it seems very safe. It's, you can get it online. When I had to get it, my, my own dog had uh, hemangiosarcoma in her liver and I found it on walmart.com for the cheapest, um, but it does seem to help. I also wanted to mention um, a new screening test. Mostly wanted to mention it because I think there's gonna be more marketing for it. Um, and I think there's gonna be more questions coming up. It's called New Q Vet Cancer Screening. Um, and they're really marketing it, especially for hemangiosarcoma and lymphoma right now. There is potential that it can be used for other, screen, uh, for other cancers, but basically it's looking for markers that circulate in the blood. The markers, unfortunately, are not specific to cancer, so you can see those markers increased in inflammatory disease or after trauma. Um, and the, I bring it up just because, again, I think we're going to be hearing more about it. Really, we need to learn more. I think it's, there's currently studies um, being conducted at Texas A&M Veterinary School, and we really need, I think, to wait for those studies before we make any recommendations. I know the website is talking about, you know, trying to use it for, again, yearly or twice yearly screening for older animals to see if there's a risk for cancer. I guess my big question for that is, we know that lymphoma and hemangiosarcoma can both come up quickly. So if we're doing it just yearly or twice a year, our timing really has to be perfect, I think, for that to be able to be beneficial. And it's the question of, even if we can catch the cancer a little bit earlier, we still are going to do confirmatory tests. And I'm not sure that it's necessarily going to lead to improved outcome if we start treatment early, just because, again, with hemangiosarcoma and lymphoma, we know that they progress quickly. Um, and I'm just not sure earlier treatment is going to be beneficial. So again, bring it up just so you guys are aware of it, that it's out there, and we'll probably be hearing more about it in the next couple years. So moving on to melanoma. So melanomas are tumors that arise from the melanocytes, which are the pigment producing cells. There are some amelanotic or apigmented versions of melanoma, just to be extra confusing. Um, but this is a very similar disease in many ways to the melanomas that occur in people. They are very biologically similar in how they behave. But the biggest difference is that the melanomas in dogs are not solar induced, they're not UV dependent. So there's no component of sunlight exposure that leads to melanomas in dogs. We typically see melanomas occur in more heavily pigmented breeds. So like Scottish Terriers, um, like giant schnauzers and black poodles, um, tends to be some, some increased incidence for oral melanomas in smaller breeds and then older age. You know, again, it's the disease largely of older dogs, dogs over eight or 10 years of age. So locations, the most common location is the oral cavity. It is the most common oral tumor we see in dogs. So this is a very ugly picture of melanomas that can occur. So the dog's nose is here. This is their upper jaw, bottom jaw, canine teeth. Um, and then this is a breathing tube. This is a patient that was being treated with radiation therapy. So this really big, ugly pigmented tumor occurring there. They're unfortunately highly aggressive. They can invade into the local tissues. They can invade into bone. So making it a little bit trickier to remove. And unfortunately the oral cavity melanomas have a high metastatic rate in the papers is anywhere from kind of 70 to 96% will ultimately metastasize to local lymph nodes, the lymph nodes in the neck or to the lungs. There is also digit melanoma, which again have local invasion into the bone. Overall, they have a lower metastatic potential, so only about 30 to 40% again to lymph nodes and lungs. So this is an image from a patient that we treated, it's his radiograph. 
you can appreciate some normal looking nails here. And then this digit, it's kind of irregular and a little bit lytic or breakdown of the bone there. So that was uh, a melanoma of his toe. And then lastly, we can see melanomas in the skin. And a big contrast to humans is that skin melanomas in dogs are largely benign. We don't think of them as being aggressive tumors and usually surgery can potentially cure these patients. So this is an image from a dog that had a somewhat atypical um, dermal melanoma where there was a bigger plaque area and then lots of these little black dermal nodules. Again, usually they're pigmented um, when we find them. So clinical signs, again, are going to depend on location. For oral cavity tumors, bad breath um, is a very common first sign. And it's, it's more than just your typical kind of bad doggy breath. It's like really, really bad. Um, we had a run of just really bad oral tumors, oral melanomas for a while. And it was when I was pregnant and one of our technicians was pregnant. And we were both very... <laughs> very sensitive about smells. So we'd walk into the room and we'd both have to leave because it, it's just, it's this really nasty rotting smell. Um, so if you notice that something to be concerned about, any changes in eating habits, like difficulty chewing out of one side of their mouth, suddenly dropping food, not wanting to chew harder food is something to, to look out for. It could be just normal dental disease, but just wanna check out the oral cavity any blood in drool or in the water dish or on food is again, another potential sign that we wanna watch for. And you know, this will be my soapbox that it's a great idea to, to try to brush your dog's teeth as much as you're able, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because I am not very good at regularly brushing my dog's teeth. But then at least you're just in there every day, you're kind of checking out things. And if you can, you can see some more subtle changes if they're occurring earlier, if you're in there more frequently and checking things out. For digital melanomas, melanomas in the toe, usually it's a limping or a lameness because their toe hurts. There might be a non-healing toenail infection um, or swelling of the toe. And then again, for the skin, usually it's just a little pigmented mass. Usually they're very small. Um, and again, they might be present for years without causing a problem. So usually for diagnostics for these guys, we're going to start with getting some sort of tissue sample, either a biopsy where we actually get a chunk of the tissue or a fine needle aspirate um, where we're just taking uh, some of the cells. It can be difficult to, difficult to diagnose these because the cells can look very different. We call them the great pretender because some cells, some melanomas may look like sarcomas, some may look like carcinomas, they can just look very, very different under microscopes. So oftentimes special stains are needed. If we ever have a tumor that's really confusing and that's stumping all our pathologists, you know, our top differential is usually melanoma until we prove it's not. Also want to sample the local lymph nodes to make sure there's no evidence of metastasis. And then typically chest radiographs to look for metastasis or other imaging like a CT scan of the head if we're going to, to think about further treatment. So treatment is surgery to remove the primary tumor. So for oral tumors, again, they typically invade bone. So we're looking at a larger surgery most often, including removing part of the jaw. Dogs can do really, really well with those types of surgeries. They can adjust very, very quickly um, for toe tumors looking at digit amputation, and then for skin tumors, usually it's just a, a more straightforward kind of remove the tumor and a little bit of skin around it. If we can't remove the tumor, either because of size or location, um, or because we've tried to remove the tumor and we know we left cells behind, then we turn to radiation therapy. And we can see melanomas be pretty responsive to radiation therapy. Um, so that is a very common treatment um, that we utilize for them and dogs usually tolerate radiation therapy very well. Unfortunately, we have not yet got to the point where we can ask dogs to sit still for the radiation treatment. So it does need to be performed under general anesthesia. Um, and it's usually for, for melanomas, about four to five treatments of radiation therapy that we're looking at.
One thing that has been shown in multiple studies is that chemotherapy does not extend survival. Melanomas tend to be very resistant to chemotherapy, and that's very similar to human oncology. Melanomas just don't really respond to, to chemotherapy in humans as well. But we do see that they can respond to immunotherapy. So if we can boost the immune system to kind of fight the melanoma cells, we can see that that can be beneficial. So one of the treatments we do have available is the Onsept melanoma vaccine from Muriel. It's a very interesting vaccine in that it's actually made from human DNA. And so it's human DNA that's involved in the pigment production pathway. So because it's foreign DNA, when we inject it into the dog, the immune system says, hey, this doesn't belong here and mounts a, an immune response against that. But the DNA sequence is actually very similar to the dog. It's a very similar enzyme in the dog. So our goal is that it's attacking then the, the same target in the dog. So it's great in theory. We know it's extremely safe, but there's a lot of mixed evidence about how, how beneficial it is. Some of the early papers suggested it extended survival quite a bit. Um, some of the later papers have now kind of called that into question and showed no really difference in survival. Anecdotally, I think it works in some dogs. I've seen some dogs that have responded and they're actually had metastatic lesions that have disappeared. And I've seen some dogs where I'm not sure it does anything. So I, again, we know it's very safe. We don't have another available option. I think if money was no issue in my dog, I would do it because I know it's safe. It might do something. Um, and again, we don't have any better options. So prognosis is gonna vary a lot. Even in the oral cavity, the prognosis is gonna vary a lot depending on size, if there's some testes present at presentation, and features on the biopsy reports, like um, how, how much is the tumor dividing? And survival is really dependent on local control. So if you can get a very small tumor that's well differentiated and you can do complete removal with surgery, that dog could potentially live for years versus if you have a really big, ugly tumor that grew very, very fast um, and we're treating more palliatively with like radiation therapy, that may be only a couple months. So it's hard to kind of pinpoint specific prognosis until we see the, the exact patient. Um, for the melanomas of the toe, median survival time is about a year with surgery. And again, these are usually older animals, so they may all die from something else. Um, and then for the skin melanomas, they're considered benign. So if we can surgically remove them, we're looking at potentially a cure or long-term survival. Want to mention just a couple of clinical trials that we have going on at UW. Melanoma is a because of the similarities to humans and because there aren't a lot of great treatment options, it is um, a very common tumor type that we have clinical trials for. So the, the first we have is through the VA um, and it's looking at combining radiation plus immunostimulation um, and immunostimulant is injected directly in the tumor. And the goal is to try to get the immune response to help fight that tumor by kind of aggravating it with radiation. So it's looking for primary melanoma tumors that have not metastasized. There are a fair amount of rechecks that happen and have to happen here. Um, and there's frequent biopsies of the tumor and local lymph node that have to occur. So it's um, a very funded trial. It's a great option, but it does involve a lot of travel back and forth here um, and a little bit more involved. And then the other study we have, which is quite exciting is a collaboration with the UW Carbone Cancer Center, which is the human cancer center that's just down the street from us. It's looking at metastatic melanomas, again, inject, uh, injecting a radioisotope, so kind of systemic radiation that is very locally delivered, should just be delivered to the tumor, plus an immunostimulant um, to see if we can cause the metastatic lesions to improve. And the ultimate goal is that they're gonna to move to human studies if they see a benefit in dogs. They have seen benefits in mouse studies. So that's why they kind of moved on to our dog patients. Um, so they're both great studies. They're very well funded if you have patients that, that fit into this criteria, which hopefully you don't, but if you know anyone, they are available. And then last two where I'll specifically talk about today is lymphoma. 
So lymphoma is a cancer of the lymphocyte, which is the type of white blood cell. So because it's a, a cancer of white blood cells that freely circulates throughout the body, we do think of it as a systemic disease. It is the most common cancer in dogs, um, but lymphoma is another kind of umbrella term. Technically, there's dozens of types of lymphoma, um, and they're really good at kind of subtyping it in humans, and we're, we're getting better about subtyping it in dogs, but we're not quite there yet. So usually when we're talking about lymphoma, we're talking about the multicentric form where multiple lymph nodes throughout the body are enlarged. But because it is a systemic disease, we can't see other forms of lymphoma, like lymphoma that just occurs in the skin or just occurs in the liver and spleen. But for the majority of dogs, it's a multicentric form, and that's what I'll be talking about mostly today. So on the right, we have some cytology from lymphoma. Um, so it is a, it's a very beautiful um, type of cancer under the microscope. So to point out what we are looking at when we're looking under the microscope, this little tiny blue cell here is a normal lymphocyte. So it's very dark, it's a very dense nucleus, and then there's all these really big cells around it um, that are basically immature lymphocytes. They're lymphocytes that are cancerous, they're not going throughout their full maturation cycle, um, and they're just going crazy and, and dividing like crazy. So this kind of blobby looking cell here is actually a cell that's undergoing division. So it's dividing in front of our eyes because it's just growing so quickly. So risk factors for lymphoma, the biggest thing is, is breed and genetics. As we're learning more about the dog genome, um, we're starting to see more specific genes involved, especially in specific breeds of dogs. Goldens are the poster children for, for lymphoma. Um, in certain families of Goldens, we have been able to pinpoint some specific genetic mutations that lead to increased lymphoma risk. So it's very exciting um, what Michelle was talking about, being able to collect some of those genetic samples on Scotty's just to see if more information can be pinpointed about, you know, in families with lymphoma or if there's a specific gene involved. Boxers are the other poster children. Bernie's Mountain Dogs um, is also a very common breed. Again, we can see it more common in middle-aged to older dogs, but lymphoma can also affect very young dogs. We've unfortunately seen some puppies or some just two-year-old or four-year-old dogs with lymphoma. So it is a cancer that can occur in younger dogs. And that's similar, unfortunately, to human oncology. We can see the lymphoma and leukemia in, in young patients as well. Some risk factors that have been identified, um, immunosuppression, so chronic immunosuppression because of other diseases or other medications, um, or not that it occurs very commonly in veterinary world, but um, organ transplant uh, patients can have an increased risk of lymphoma. And then there's been some environmental factors that have been looked at. I put an asterisk next to this because it's pretty controversial and there's not a lot of strong evidence for these. Um, and tobacco smoke, use of pesticides, specifically 2,4-D amine um, herbicide on lawns has been associated with an increased risk of lymphoma. If, you're, if you live close to like a waste treatment facility or waste incinerator that has been associated with an increased risk. But these have all been kind of shown in like one or two studies and then other studies have not necessarily shown that. So it's, again, it's still very unknown. It's still very difficult to study this in veterinary patients just because there's millions of different factors that are different amongst different households. So potential link there, but very weak evidence for it. So talking about, again, most commonly we see multicentric lymphoma. So the most common clinical signs are just an enlargement of multiple lymph nodes. And usually that's it. Usually dogs are still feeling fine, but owners just notice that their lymph nodes are enlarged. And so they take them into their vet who then finds more. So it's good to know where the normal lymph nodes are in, in the body. Um, just so those are areas that you can kind of pet on a regular basis and make sure there's no big swelling there. So the mandibular lymph nodes live right under the chin. There's a salivary gland that lives right there too that is normally a little bit bigger. So sometimes you know, you'll palpate that and worry, but there is a, a salivary gland that should be a little bit larger that lives there. 
normal lymph nodes are about the size of like a lima bean or a pea. So they're usually pretty small. There's some variation with, with dog size. So obviously bigger dogs are, have bigger lymph nodes. Some dogs have more fat around their lymph nodes that make them feel a little bit bigger. And lymph nodes can be enlarged for inflammation or infection too. So it's common in some dogs that have pretty severe dental disease for their mandibular lymph nodes to be just a little bit more plump. But usually dogs with lymphoma have very big lymph nodes, like golf ball size. So quite a big difference from what they should be. Other lymph nodes live in front of the shoulder blades. And then behind the knee is kind of the, the common ones that we can typically feel even if they're normal. There are lymph nodes that live under the, under the armpit and in the groin area. We usually don't feel those unless they're enlarged just because they're a little bit deeper under some of the fat and tissue. Um, and there's usually extra fat in that area that makes feeling again, like a, a normal pea size thing hard to feel unless they're big. But again, good things just to know where they live. Just so if you see a swelling, you can kind of think hmm, that might be a lymph node, or again, just to pet those areas commonly to make sure there's nothing going awry. If you become a veterinary oncologist, that ends up being the first thing you pet on any dog you meet. <laughs> just by habit, I'm feeling under dog's chins. And then it leads to some awkward conversations with people like, oh, your dog's lymph node feels a little bit big. Um, so diagnostics, lymphoma is typically diagnosed just with a fine needle aspirate and cytology. So just a little needle like we would use for a blood draw, take some cells from that lymph node. It's usually a pretty painless procedure and send that off to the lab. So it's usually fairly quick to get a diagnosis. We don't usually need a biopsy. Um, sometimes if it's a very early lymphoma, it's just emerging or it's when a a different type of lymphoma, we might need a biopsy, but for the most part, we don't. Um, flow cytometry is a new type of test that we are using. Um, that is, our goal is that it's gonna give us more information about specific types of lymphomas and maybe guide treatment. So it's, it's a kind of a neat test. You have to take live cells. So we take a sample from the lymph node, we put it in serum and we send it to Colorado State University they put it through this great big machine where they can put cells through in a single file and they interrogate it with lasers. And the lasers will tell how big the cells are, how complex the cells are, and they can look at specific markers on the cells. And ultimately they get a report that they then interpret for us that it's this, this type of lymphoma and it's been associated with this type of prognosis. So we're still a little bit in the learning phase. Um, you know, I usually tell owners, it might tell us something different about your lymphoma that might change our treatment. Um, but we also want to just continue to accumulate more samples so that we're building a database and you know, a year or five years or 10 years down the road, we have this great big database that we can go back and then tell, tell owners if there's gonna be a difference in, in survival. One thing it can tell us pretty reliably is if it's a T cell versus a B cell lymphoma, and that's important for prognosis. B cell lymphomas tend to respond better to chemotherapy and they tend to, to live longer. So that is important to know. Um, usually we'll do blood work at the initial visit that may show an, an anemia, it could show low platelets um, if the bone marrow is involved, but sometimes it can be completely normal. And then there are staging tests that we can do. And staging tests are basically designed to look at where is the lymphoma in the body. We know it's a systemic disease, so it's just showing us what all is involved. We do test radiographs to look if the lymph nodes in the chest are enlarged or rarely there's some lung involvement. We do an abdominal ultrasound to look at the lymph nodes that live in the belly and also look at liver and spleen. And then we can do a bone marrow aspirate to show if there's any cells that are invading the bone marrow. Um, although we usually have some indication if that's happening, if the dog has like an anemia or low platelets or low white blood cells on blood work. So I put an asterisk next to the staging test because we've moved away from doing these in every patient over the last decade or so, um, because it, we've shown that it doesn't necessarily change how we treat those patients and it doesn't necessarily change prognosis. So if you have a dog that has a stage three lymphoma where lymph nodes under the chin and behind the knee are involved, it's not gonna be a worse prognosis if that dog also has liver and spleen involvement. So we've moved away from doing some of those staging tests just because they cost money 
it's ultimately not going to change what we do. So why don't we use that money just towards treatment if the owner, you know, is more inclined to do that. So treatment, because it's a systemic disease, we do, do, we do systemic treatment such as chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is a, a scary word. We probably all have experience with human friends or family members that have undergone chemotherapy and knows about some of the severe side effects. The big difference in, in veterinary patients is, you know, we are operating more on the pediatric oncology model where we're happy to be our patient's advocate we want them to have a good quality of life. We don't want them to be sick and miserable. Um, so we use a less, less dose on a pound per pound basis. So most dogs are gonna go through chemotherapy with very mild side effects if they have any things that we can manage at home um, with medications or diet modification. The risk of hospitalization secondary to chemotherapy is very low. It's less than five to 10% and the risk of death secondary to chemotherapy is less than 1%. It's extremely rare because we're focusing much more on quality of life. So our kind of gold standard treatment is CHOP-based chemotherapy, which is a combination of three different chemotherapy agents and prednisone. We do a 19-week protocol here, um, and it's typically weekly chemotherapy with a break every four weeks in there. So it is more intensive and certainly something to consider if owner is traveling from a, a far distance away. Um, so we can use single agent chemotherapies as well, just giving one drug every three weeks typically, so less intensive. And typically we do see that the response rate and the duration of remission decreases if we go from one of those CHOP-based protocols, multiple chemotherapy protocols to a single agent, but we can still see great quality of life and an extension of quality of life. And then if we don't do chemotherapy, a more palliative treatment is prednisone. Um, we can see patients have a great response to prednisone. It can really improve their quality of life, typically for only a couple of months, but it, you know, still good quality of life. And it's still something that at a minimum we can do to make them feel better. So in general, we do see a good initial response to chemotherapy. We can see patients go into clinical remission, meaning their lymph nodes shrink down to normal size. We don't see any evidence of disease within days of giving chemotherapy. Um, so if a patient is having more severe signs. Again, most patients feel great. It's just these enlarged lymph nodes, but some patients can be tired. They can have vomiting and diarrhea. We can see them feel much better within a day or two with starting chemotherapy. So it's a very satisfying disease to treat. We can see things respond very, very quickly. And, and those patients, again, feel better quickly, or at least see their lymph nodes shrink down in size very quickly. Unfortunately, it's a very low cure rate. Um, there will be about 10% of dogs that survive a year or two or longer and we think may be cured. We have a couple of patients here that are coming in for their four-year lymphoma recheck and that's always wonderful to see. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the case for the majority of patients. In general, the average survival, the median survival time is about a year with, with treatment, um, again, I've kind of talked about it already, but prognostic factors, B cell lymphomas are better. If the patient is feeling normal, feeling great, just big lymph nodes at presentation, that's better than dogs that are not feeling well. Um, and then stage to some degree also affects it, but it's really only if you have a stage five disease, which is when there's severe bone marrow involvement or other organ involvement that it, it drops the prognosis. So about a year, and again, we do have patients that do better than that. Unfortunately, we have some that don't respond quite as well. So these are just some images from a patient that I treated last year. This is little Mason. Um, he, if you can appreciate, so he's a Jack Russell, or I think it was a Jack Russell rat terrier, but he has a swelling under his jaw. And that's where his mandibular lymph nodes lived. And here's his other side. So you can see his face looks really swollen and his jaw looks swollen. This was after just one dose of chemotherapy. He has this nice little svelte neck back um, and his lymph nodes went from being like five centimeters, which is, you know, pretty big for a little dog down to normal. So, you know, that was a very satisfying thing to see that we can get them to respond very quickly. Some treatment updates. Um, again, this is another disease like hemangiosarcoma where we feel like we haven't really made a lot of progress in the last couple decades. So we're looking at further chemotherapy drugs, new treatment options that we can try to offer that might change that. 
So Laverdia is a drug that you may have heard about because there were um, the FDA just recently conditionally approved it. And it's always a big deal because there's not very many drugs that the FDA conditionally approves for veterinary use only. Most of the time we're borrowing drugs from the human medicine field. Um, but it has been granted conditional approval. It's given orally, it's given twice weekly. It's mostly marketed for like a rescue therapy for dogs that have gone through other chemotherapy protocols and either had progressive disease. Um, so it is something that is out there and seems to be well tolerated. We don't have a lot of experience with it yet, but I'm hoping that we're gonna be starting a clinical trial looking at it more in the next couple months. And then Tenovia is another um, medication, newer chemotherapy, also has FDA conditional approval. It's given by IV. We were doing a lot of the initial studies here. It was showing some promise. Unfortunately, there is a risk of pulmonary fibrosis in about 5% of patients. And that is more of a concern in terriers because terriers can have kind of an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so it is something that I'd be a little bit hesitant to use in like Westies or Scotties. It's also very expensive now that it's outside of the trial setting. So it's not necessarily the first drug I reach for, but it, it's available and it is something that can be used for rescue and is we do see good responses from it. So lymphoma trials um, that we have at UW, I know I'm going over a little bit, sorry. Um, if anyone also has boxers, we have an environmental risk factor for boxers and lymphoma. It's basically just looking at a urine sample. And then there's a questionnaire about like household chemical exposure, again, trying to see if there is any environmental factors that may contribute to lymphoma development. We have a trial that's looking at incorporating Tenovia, again, that new drug into our CHOP protocol to see if we can improve survival beyond CHOP, our kind of typical CHOP alone. Um, and the cost of the Tenovia drug is covered. And then um, there's a, a trial looking at to evaluate the immune cell response in B cell lymphoma. So it's looking at patients that are newly diagnosed before they start CHOP therapy. Um, it's just collecting lymph node aspirates and blood samples at diagnosis a week after starting chemotherapy and at relapse. So it does involve some travel here. And it, it pays for the flow cytometry to determine if it's a B or T cell lymphoma. So very quickly, just wanted to mention some of the other clinical trials at UW. Um, we have a VAX trial, the VAX study right now, which again, you may have heard about because there's been some press about it. It's a fairly novel strategy that instead of trying to treat cancer after it starts, it's a vaccine looking to see if it can prevent cancer. So it's a very large trial that's being conducted at multiple sites, us, CSU, Davis, and a site in Arizona. Um, and I think there's going to be 500 dogs enrolled throughout the site. So it's a, a very big trial for veterinary medicine. And dogs are either given a vaccine that contains proteins that are commonly found in cancer or placebo. And the thought is if we're giving the body these kind of proteins that may be involved in cancer, hopefully the immune system is recognizing them and then we'll be better able to attack and fight them if it sees that they're starting to develop. So with the ultimate goal that hopefully it will prevent cancer. So regardless of whether the patients have the vaccine or placebo, because we don't know, it's, a, it's blinded, so no one knows who gets what, um, they'll be well monitored for five years after enrollment with blood work um, and good physical exams. And there is a financial incentive that if the, a dog does develop cancer while on the trial, um, there will be some coverage of further diagnostics and treatments. Um, I think it's about $1,000 or $2,000. So for eligibility, I put the website here. There's also an email address you can use to, to get through a clinical trials team to, if you have questions. We're looking at middle-aged to older dogs, so five and a half to 11 and a half years, over 12 pounds that don't have a history of cancer or autoimmune disease, oh, sorry, or other major illness, not currently an immunosuppressive medication, and within 150 miles of the treatment center. So if some of you are outside Door County, that might be more amenable. I know it's a little bit far for Door County. And then here are some TCC clinical trials. Again, I know Dr. Knapp will be talking more about TCC. We do have a BRAF screening trial here. Um, so looking at breeds at risk, so Scotties, Westies, Shelties, and four other breeds over six years of age. And it's just submitting a urine sample to look at the BRAF test, which is looking for a genetic mutation that's present in about 85% of dogs that have TCCs. And then if it's positive, there's gonna be 
further testing and, and follow up for 12 months at no cost to you, um, just to see if we can use this to screen dogs early. And then there's also similar to the boxer lymphoma an environmental risk factor evaluation for dogs diagnosed with TCC with a urine sample and a questionnaire about household exposures. So sorry, went a little bit over there. Um, happy to answer any questions. And I also put my email address and then our service email address up there if you have further questions, as well as our website um, and the clinical studies. And happy to take any questions. Matt, are you available? available? Mackenzie, uh, yeah, Mackenzie, we have a questions in the chat here. Okay. Uh, what, is, um, what is the youngest age of canine uh, hemangial sarcoma? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I, I feel like it is largely middle age to older. I want to say most of the patients I can think of have been, you know, eight years or older. I don't really recall seeing one in a very young patient. Again, usually if we're seeing younger patients is more commonly lymphoma or something weird, but hemangiosarcoma, sarcoma, I feel like it's mostly been older patients. And then we have another question here from Michelle. Um, can you explain the difference between T and B cell? Yeah, so getting not too molecular about it. So basically there's multiple types of lymphocytes in your body. The B cell lymphocytes are those that produce like antibodies. And then the T cell lymphocytes are ones that more commonly like attack cells and actually eat cells. So it's just a difference in what those arise, what lymphoma it arises from. For T cell lymphomas, we more commonly see that they're associated with a hypercalcemia, which can make patients feel sick. Um, dogs with T cell lymphoma are more likely to feel sick at diagnosis as well. Um, and it just seems in general that they just don't respond as well to chemotherapy. The, you know, there's been some older trials where they've just given a single dose of chemotherapy and like 95% of B cell lymphoma patients respond to one dose of chemotherapy, whereas only 50% of the T-cell lymphomas did. So it just seemed to be a little bit more resistant to chemotherapy, and we don't necessarily know why. Um, and, and let's see, let's, um, are there any subtle early signs of lymphoma besides swollen nose? Uh, they lost the dog at four and a half. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, really, it's another one where it comes on so quickly that the, the swollen lymph nodes are really the biggest thing. Again, if you can get in the habit of just kind of petting those areas more, it's tough because sometimes they can pop up overnight. And we've had patients that, you know, we're treating, they come in for a recheck, they're in remission, and then we get a call two days later that suddenly their lymph nodes are swollen. So there's not, unfortunately, a lot you can do besides just trying to check on those things regularly. Um, again, that new Q screening test talks about how potentially it could be used for lymphoma. I think we still need to learn a lot more. Like right now, we don't know how much more quickly that screening test can work, but that might be something we can look at, but really we don't have anything great right now. Um, we have two questions from Lori here. The first is, have you had experience with dogs who are also receiving alternative uh, therapies under the care of an integrative medicine veterinarian? I'm sorry, receiving? Uh, oh. Alternative therapies under oh. the care of uh, integrative medicine. Yeah, yeah. We, we have quite a few patients that are coming in um, on alternative therapies. Admittedly, I don't know as much about the alternative therapies because there's, you know, so much more training you could do on that aspect too. Um, and I haven't been able to get into that as 